Hello there, my name is Jonathan McKinney. I'm a certified physician assistant. I practice in Providence, Rhode Island, and I'm passionate about LGBTQ plus health. Uh, one of the things I wanna do on this channel is review journal articles as they come out and as it pertains to LGBTQ plus sexual health, physical health, or mental health. Uh, hopefully, I can give you some key takeaways from these journal articles that you can take forth and prosper in your own lives um, and improve your own health. Um, so, without further ado, let's dive into today's topic. It is a systematic review of kissing as a risk factor for oropharyngeal gonorrhea or chlamydia. Oropharyngeal meaning mouth and throat, uh, and of course kissing, uh, is that a risk factor for transmitting these STDs. Of course, we all know that cl chlamydia and gonorrhea can be transmitted through sexual intercourse, um, but kissing less well known. This is, was published in 2023 in the Journal of Sexually Transmitted Diseases. I like to jump directly into the results. So the systematic review, meaning it takes together a bunch of different articles and tries to come to one conclusion. Uh, basically this found that it provided some evidence to suggest a possible association between kissing and oropharyngeal gonorrhea. But in contrast, that there was no evidence for an association between kissing and oropharyngeal chlamydia. So the six eligible studies that they looked at, five of which examined gonorrhea and one of which examined chlamydia. Of the five studies examining gonorrhea, all found that kissing was an association with oropharyngeal gonorrhea among MSM, which stands for men who have sex with men. And the studies, all of this research was done in Australia. And so it's hard to extrapolate this data in the United States, but I think some sexual practices certainly translate over to the United States. Uh, but the, some of the limitations of this research is that the uncertainty created by multiple sexual activities with a high collinearity of current during single sexual encounter is a key issue that impedes confirming the role of kissing as an independent risk factor. Breaking that down further, Kissing leads to more things, and it's hard to control for human behavior. When you're kissing somebody, it tends to lead to, you know, more. You know, whether it's whether it's fellatio or uh, cunnilingus or um, actual, you know, insert or penetrative sex. So it's hard to it's hard to control for those things. But those are the high level results. It's that gonorrhea is associated with kissing. Chlamydia is not. The research is overall lacking, um, but I do want to dive into a little bit more background about these because again, my whole goal for this sort of video series is that you can take away some of the key points here and change what you're doing. So a little bit of important background on this is that chlamydia is the most common uh, notified uh, STI, that gonorrhea is an urgent public health threat because of antimicrobial resistance. This means that we are having some difficulties using our typical antibiotics to treat uh, gonorrhea. Now, typically gonorrhea, uh, you know, let's say you have gonorrhea um, of the urethra, urethritis. Um, that can, you know, we give the injection of ceftriaxone or rocephin, uh, 500 milligram uh, IM injection. It's pretty much it. We'll typically also cover you with doxycycline um, or some other antibiotic. Uh, to cover you also for chlamydia because the uh, rates of co-infection are actually quite high as well. But the, the scary part is that gonorrhea can become resistant to some of our antibiotics. If you've ever heard of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, that is so scary because a lot of the antibiotics we use to treat you know, uh, this bacteria have become resistant, and so it is resistant to um, these bugs. So imagine an STD that is untreatable. Of course, we have you know, HIV, which has PrEP, and I think in the PrEP era, we are seeing a lot more condomless sex and therefore a lot more bacterial STDs. You know, we've tamed HIV transmission to an extent, but the bacterial STDs are still, are still up there. And so the, the threat of antimicrobial resistance is a concerning one. So, uh, but the other thing here is that since 2010, uh, there has been a substantial increase among gonorrhea, among gay, uh, bisexual men who have sex with men. So this is really you know, uh, relatable to our community. To better understand the trends, investigators have started re-examining the mode of transmission, so kissing. Um, and the CDC has actually come out and said that the role of kissing as an STI transmission has not been really well studied in their 2021 guidelines. Now, 
Now, the background here is that gonorrhea, chlamydia of the mouth and throat is often asymptomatic, which means individuals may not be aware uh, of the infection, but certainly that this could you know, lead to transmission to other people that do not know it. And even though it's not typically symptomatic, <clears throat> I pulled uh, out a piece of information from one of the clinical resources that I use pretty much every day when I'm taking care of patients it's called Up to Date, very common in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure in you know elsewhere, but we use this every day. Um, but I want to point out this bit of information in that the majority of oropharyngeal infections of Neisseria gonorrhea are asymptomatic. Although sore throat, pharyngeal exudates, which means those white patches that you can get with like strep throat, mono, and gonorrhea, uh, the white patches on like kind of the back of your throat, um, or cervical lymphadenitis, swollen lymph nodes in the neck. Um, are present in some cases of gonorrhea of the mouth and throat. And then in a study of 192 individuals seeking care for sore throat in just a general medical setting, about 1% had a positive throat culture for Neisseria gonorrhea. So me, you know, I'm currently working in the emergency room. I see sore throat pretty regularly. I mean, uh, you know, let's say 100, probably 100, uh, I probably see about 100 patients over the course of two weeks with a sore throat. Um, and to say one out of those 100 has gonorrhea. So I think that if providers aren't asking the right questions, uh, sexual practices and exposures, that you potentially could be missing this. Um, so something to keep in mind. So let's dive a little bit more into the actual research. Again, this is a systematic review. Uh, there were five different studies looked at for gonorrhea and only one for chlamydia. Uh, but just to dive in here, gonorrhea, uh, of course, uh, let's dive, Cornelise et al. conducted a one to two age match case control study. There's 531 men who had sex with men. This was in Melbourne in 2015. Uh, there was 177 cases and 354 controls. Overall, they found that men with oropharyngeal gonorrhea were 2.17 times more likely to have tongue kissed their casual partners in the past three months compared to men who did not have oropharyngeal gonorrhea. But, as we'll see in a lot of this research, kissing was highly correlated with receptive oral penal sex and the total number of casual sexual partners. In other words, if you kissed with your tongue, you were more likely to kiss more, of, more people and kissing tends to lead to other sexual acts. And so that when they controlled for these behavioral kind of factors, it is not significantly associated with oropharyngeal gonorrhea. We'll see this as a common trend until we get to the final studies. But the second one is Templeton et al. conducted a prospective uh, cohort of 1,427 men. So following men a long time as we go forward uh, between 01 and 07 in Sydney, Australia. They investigated the association between wet kissing and dry kissing. So open mouth with tongue or closed mouth. Use your imaginations. Uh, authors found that the odds of acquiring oropharyngeal gonorrhea increase with both wet and dry kissing with their casual partners in the last six months. However, the association was not significant when you adjusted for rimming, uh, receptive penile oral sex, and in the multivariable analysis. So when you control for these other things, that kissing was not as associated with it. Chow et al., it's a 12-week study, uh, cohort, again, in, uh, this is in Melbourne, Australia, and this is looking at 100 uh, men who had sex with men taking PrEP at one of their sexual health clinics. Again, we see with PrEP, uh, you know, it, it certainly is, is an amazing drug in that it, it really reduces the transmission of HIV. However, and, you know, the guidelines say, even though you're using PrEP, it doesn't mean you don't have to use condoms or other, you know, forms of protection. Uh, People aren't doing that, you know. It, it, it is it is it is a sense of I feel safe not using a condom, so I'm not going to use one. So we are seeing an increased rate in STDs. But what this study was uh, from August uh, to August to October of 2019, weekly saliva specimens were collected, sent to the uh, postal service to the clinic, and then also a clinician collected the saliva samples at weeks zero and twelve. What they found is that oropharyngeal gonorrhea was found to be associated with the number of kissing partners in the past week. The more people you kiss, the more likely you were to have gonorrhea. Um, however, the high collinearity of sexual practices made it difficult to establish individual exposures of mouth or urethra independently. So it, again, it's hard to control for these variables with, with human behavior. 
These last two studies are, are the meat and potatoes, in my opinion. Chow et al. recruited 3,600 men who had sex with men, cross-sectional study of sexual health clinic in Melbourne between 2016 and 2017. The overall prevalence of gonorrhea of the mouth and throat was 6.2%, which is 229 out of the 3,600. The study collected data on a number of kissing, on, uh, of kissing partners, so kissing only, it, sex only, and then also kissing with sex partners. So these three things in the last three months. Overall, the study found that after adjusting for potential confounding factors, men who had sex with men uh, kissed greater than or equal to four partners had a 1.46 fold higher odds of having oropharyngeal gonorrhea compared to those who only had zero to one kissing partner in the last three months. The study was limited in that it did not include direct measures of other sexual activities. But when you, when you look at that, four or more kissing partners had a 1.46 fold increased odds. Well, I'm sort of imagining myself like in a bar or in a club and I imagine myself, my friends going around and, and kissing each other just to say hello. Um, and how easily, I'm wondering, could that gonorrhea, if someone has gonorrhea of the mouth or throat, could that be spread? I know that typically when you're going up and kissing your friends, it's not an intimate, you know, but you, you know your friends, but it's not an intimate sort of uh, <laughs> swap of saliva. It's usually just like a kiss on the uh, lips or cheek. Obviously, I don't think the cheek would be much of a risky situation, but um, I'm wondering, you know, when you're introducing yourselves and you're going around and kissing your friends, does that pose a risk? Those are my questions. Um, and then one of the studies, like we, like we looked at earlier, did look at wet versus dry kissing, but there really wasn't any data that they could draw from that. The final study here, Tran et al. recruited 2,300 uh, men who had sex with men. This is between 2018 and 2020. So partially into the COVID pandemic, which we'll talk about a little later. But the prevalence of gonorrhea in this population was 5.2%. So that was 120 out of the 2,300 people that was uh, examined. Overall, this study examined the association between kissing and gonorrhea of the mouth and throat and also adjusted for other sexual practices, such as fellatio or rimming. Overall, oropharyngeal gonorrhea was significantly associated with increased number of kissing partners. So really, this is correlating, this data correlates with the data up a little bit higher here um, for the Chow et al. study. So number of kissing partners increases your risk of gonorrhea. But as the researchers note that this did include a period during the COVID pandemic, which may have influenced some of the sexual practices uh, not described. You know, So I think with COVID, it did change our sexual practices in that we may, we may have either slept with more or less people, depending on where you're at and how rigid you were with the COVID restrictions. I know a lot of people hunkered down, they stayed at home, but then yet there was an, another group of people who wanted to go out and, and, and share things with other people <laughs> because they felt lonely and they wanted that connection. Um, so that could be confounding the, the information. But that's all that we have on gonorrhea as it relates to transmission and kissing from this systematic review. So now let's dive into some uh, the chlamydia data, which again, was only one study. This is one study uh, including 1,400 men who had sex with men by Templeton et al. Uh, it, it, there was 25 oropharyngeal chlamydia infections, mouth, throat, uh, with very low incidence overall. And what they found is that there was no association between kissing and oropharyngeal uh, chlamydia. So, the, you know, there needs to be more research about both of these things. So let's go overall, my key takeaways, how can you, what does this mean for you? So the more kissing partners you have, the more likely you are to get oropharyngeal gonorrhea. And like we discussed earlier, if you have oropharyngeal gonorrhea, it's most likely gonna be asymptomatic. So if you are going and kissing other people, you likely could be spreading it. And then the question is, you know, if you have gonorrhea of the mouth or throat, and then you, you know, give someone head, or, you know, you, you suck this, or you blow that, um, you know, then that introduces mitis of infection to that person at that site of um, anatomy. So keep that in mind. Then oropharyngeal chlamydia uh, transmission via kissing is less of a concern at this time. The key, the key, the core thing about this study is that kissing leads to more. Kissing, you know, kissing is first base. And if you get to first base, 
oftentimes we go to second or third, maybe even hit a home run. You never know. Uh, so it's hard to control for human behavior, right? Um, overall, this needs more research among different locations, different populations. I think it'd be interesting to study this in non-men who have sex with men. Also, well, you know, like heterosexual couples. And then also, I would like to see this replicated outside of Australia. Um, again, I think a lot of the sexual practices probably translate over here well. But you have to replicate data in order to have any type of really take-home rec uh, recommendations. Um, but I want to I want to emphasize this that clinicians need to be mindful in asking patients about sexual practices when they come in with a sore throat. I think it's very common to see uh, a sore throat in clinic and then you know do your rapid strep test, reflex to a culture, um, bada bing bada boom, and if that's negative, you know assume it's a viral illness and that's it. But I think adding that extra layer of you know. I always like to ask my patients, what do you think this could be? And I think that opens up a, a world of opportunities for the patient to discuss openly what they think. And they might even say, you know, I, uh, you know, I had an, you know, I, I gave someone head that I didn't know, <laughs> whatever. And I think that's important to just understand the exposures for our patients. So I hope that this, this has helped you and I hope that you continue to watch this series. Uh, I, I want to, again, pull together information from LGBTQ-related studies, peer-reviewed research, and provide you with some takeaways here. So thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to live your life out loud.